So thank you again for joining us. I'm Sherry Kimball, President and CEO here at the Chandler Chamber. And we're really excited to be bringing this program here to you as part of our public policy impact series. Um, I'd like to welcome those of you that are watching online and thank you for joining us. We really appreciate that. Um, this, these types of programs would not be possible if it wasn't for our sponsors. And I just wanna do a shout out to them. Air Products and Chemicals, Salt River Project, Planet Startup, Dignity Health Chandler Regional Medical Center, Intel, Catalyst Computer Technologies, um, Southwest Gas, Edward Jones, Terry McKibben, APS, and Dragon Walk Fine Chinese Restaurant. So without further ado, we are going to jump right in because we have a great panel of speakers. First of all, we have a video message from um, the president of Chandler Gilbert Community College, Dr. Greg Peterson, who is also one of our board members, and what at the college level, what they are doing um, to bring this forward. So, you want to roll that video? My name is Greg Peterson, president of Chandler Gilbert Community College. So excited to be here. Right now, we're honored to have Dr. Peterson speak with us. Dr. Peterson is one of the founders of our newest ECC alumni. Many thanks to Chairman Chamber for allowing us the opportunity to share some information about Chandler Gilbert, our programs, our community support for our development. Chandler Gilbert offers associates to make cybersecurity that gives students a scope of their starting career and transfer to one of our four year partners for that With over 40 IT certificates available, students can up their skill, reskill, and build competitive advantage with courses such as Amazon Web Services, to Kubernetes, to even Python. We are so proud of the partnership with the University of Arizona and Chandler Unified as we offer Bashan High School students an Associates of Applied Science degree in cybersecurity, all right here in Chandler. These are just a few examples of our commitment to workforce development and our partnership with industry, education, and government to create pathways and programs for students that lead to high paying jobs and help the economy. We couldn't do this work alone. And the Chandler Chamber was celebrating their 110th year anniversary is such a vital part of our success. Thank you for being engaged and participating in events such as this. And we look forward to being part of the What's Next for City of Chandler in the Southeast Valley. Go Coyotes. I will tell you, I wanted, we wanted to tee that off because we, as we're talking about this, it's not only about what's happening within that tech, the cybersecurity, AI, whatever, whatever in that whole realm. It is also about how do we train that workforce and how do we keep moving forward. So um, thank you for that. Here at the Chandler Chamber, we are very proud and work with our university partners and helping to create that next workforce. So we have two interns that are interning with us today that are with our public policy team, and we want to give them some practice. So I am going to turn it over and um, let them introduce one of our speakers. But let me tell you a little bit about Sebastian. Sebastian is a second generation Hispanic and is currently in his sophomore year at ASU. He is a dual major in public service and public policy, as well as economics with the hopes of attending graduate school for a master's in public policy. His areas of interest include education policy and mental and health services. So Sebastian, come on up here and introduce our first speaker. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys, and it's an even bigger pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dominic Papa. Dominic is a public entrepreneur. He is the executive director and co-founder of the Institute for Digital Progress, a non-for-profit organization designed to transform Arizona into a global hub of smart city technology, driven by collaborative civic innovation. Dominic founded IDP after working for two years with the city of Phoenix. In 2018, Dominic helped found the ASU Center for Smart Cities and Regions at Arizona State University. Dominic has a BA in political science and Italian and a master's in public administration, and he currently works for Amazon Web Services. So please help me welcome Dominic Fox. Thanks a lot for that introduction. Really appreciate it. Uh, it's great to be back here. I love coming to Chandler events. Some of you know grew up in Chandler with the Hamilton Terry. I think you and the Chandler team uh, do an incredible job of helping really drive tech, and that's why the city of Chandler uh, is at the forefront of, of all this innovation. So 
um, here in a couple different hats today to speak to you. Uh, I think this is an incredible topic to discuss. I know I've uh, just 15 minutes, so I, I want to talk quickly, but what I'm going to talk to you about a little bit today is, is the smart region update. So I came here about, I think, four years ago talking about this vision of creating a smart region, uh, the first smart region of its kind in the U.S. Um, and so I'm going to provide you a little update and how that has become the foundational framework that a lot of the specific uh, vertically focused tech like cybersecurity can really be scaled out um, across um, across our areas and our governments. Uh, this is not my presentation. That's not their presentation. But I could talk. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. No worries, no worries. Uh, so just a little bit of a background as they get it set up. Um, for those of that don't know the smart region. So we thought, um, you know, back in, wow, COVID time, 2018, that, you know, the best way we can learn from each other is to collaborate, right? And a lot of these challenges like cybersecurity, like autonomous vehicles, data, they don't stop and start in municipal boundaries, right? These things kind of obliterate those boundaries and enforces collaboration between our governments. And so how might we be able to get our governments, especially in Maricopa County, the greater Phoenix region, the fourth largest county in the country, the fastest growing in population, how can we get these governments to think together, act together, innovate together, and collaborate together? And so what we did in 2018 is we built uh, the structure for the connected, which was the first smart region of its kind in the country, and it really started to propel us forward. So again, the point of the greater Phoenix smart region, which we branded as the connected, um, was that collaboration would be the next competitive advantage, right? If we could collaborate together, our region could really be at the forefront of technology innovation, and it's, it's proving true. And so just a little bit of who is part of the connected. City of Chandler is obviously a member, um, but it brings together those 22 cities, towns, and the counties together with leading academic institutions like the Community College District, Arizona State University, GPEC, Partnership for Economic Innovation, and of course, industry partners as well, because we realize that we really need your technical expertise to help us be at that forefront of technology. So we're all always looking for new uh, industry partners to, to join the connective and help us drive smart region efforts forward. So if you're interested, please feel free to reach out. And I just touched on this already briefly, but again, the thought is how can we transform this region into a growing, thriving area where tech is developed, tested, improved, and then scaled ultimately together. Um, here's some of our strategic priorities, but I just wanted to put this up because, again, if you start to think about this as the foundation for when, when our partners are developing interesting, innovative cybersecurity programs, how might we then scale it out to other school districts, other governments, right, to other institutions? Um, and these are some of the, the key strategic areas and kind of some of our key performance indicators that we're really measuring our progress on. And if you kind of Look, it's really interesting because I, I don't know if it's, it's luck or foresight. So usually, with me, it's pretty luck. Um, but a lot of this you're, you're going to see reflected in the infrastructure bill that's coming from the federal government. So, we're actually really primed to position ourselves nicely for federal government stimulus dollars moving forward in the next this year and next year. So, since we've launched, uh, you can kind of see the ecosystem, the innovative innovation ecosystem that we've been able to develop and start to really attract into the region. And ultimately what this does is it provides capacity to you as a business, to Chandler as a government, right? To, to just help you accelerate your own initiatives and really help you innovate in new and exciting ways. So these are all resources that any of you can tap into. Um, but specifically, I wanna just highlight two big wins that we've had since the inception uh, that I think is really interesting and can really lay the framework. So. Uh, again, since we launched this, we became the first smart region in the U.S., right? First of its time. Since then, there's about seven that have been developed. But what was really exciting is we're starting to get internationally known. Um, we were the first U.S.-based city or region to be invited to participate in the European Union's 100 Intelligent Cities Program. So what the European Union did, the European Commission, is they selected 100-plus cities from across the EU to participate in this program where they're trying to accelerate their cities into smart communities. And we were actually asked to be a mentor to those 100 plus cities, right? We joined other mentor cities like Barcelona, 
like Singapore, which is a nation, but it's a nation, city, and county all at the same. Uh, Toronto, we were the only U.S. territory, U.S. city, U.S. county, U.S. region, U.S. state that was asked to join us. So we're actually becoming internationally renowned because of the collaboration that we're doing together here. And so it's really exciting because potentially programs that we're developing here, we can now share to 100 plus cities in Europe. So it's, it's just really exciting. Um, so that's one uh, kind of key win that I just wanted to touch on because it's, it's becoming really well known. So what we did is we thought, wow, this is great. Look at what the EU is doing in bringing these 100 cities together. So then we started to talk to other of those smart regions that were being developed and we said, can we do something similar? So we were actually the founders, the connective were the founders of something called the National Smart Coalition Partnership. So it's a network of smart regions that have now been developed since our since our creation of the connective that come together um, to share best practices, share information, and of course share technology across regions. But again, the connective, Greater Phoenix Smart Region was the founder of this national organization. So again, just shows the kind of innovation ecosystem that's here and the kind of big thinkers that we have. And again, we're continuing to put this market um, out there into the country and actually into the world. So it's really exciting. Finally, I just want to touch on kind of where we're focused um, this year or where the, the organization is focused since I've moved to Amazon. Um, and this is really important because I think I'll, I'll tie it into cybersecurity at the end. But digital equity, broadband expansion, digital equity and, and inclusion. Um, it's a massive challenge. I, I know Chandler is pretty well um, saturated with broadband connectivity. However, it's not just about broadband, right? It's about, do we have the equipment that these students, that these underserved communities need? Do they have the digital skills and training that they need? And of course, do they have the tech support that they need? So what we're working on regionally is how can we create a, a digital equity as a service and help ensure that all of our students, all of our underserved, unserved communities, all of the refugee populations have everything that they need to participate in the new digital economy or the new remote classroom that we're seeing. So we actually spun up a new nonprofit underneath the, the guise of the connective, really helped drive this forward. And again, develop that regional system because we know that this is not a Chandler problem. This is not an Apache Junction problem. This is not a Guadalupe problem. This is a regional problem, right? This, everyone participating in an economy digitally is gonna boost our regional economy. So we really need to do this together. And so what we're doing is we're building the structure to attack this problem regionally. And I just kind of touched on this, but again, this, this slide just highlights that people think it's, sometimes they think it's just an internet problem. If we just get their connectivity, that's all they need. It's not, it's so much more. And we really need to take this holistic approach, right? So what we started to do is build almost like a, a menu of choices. So helping communities out, do they need broadband? Okay, that's step one. Do they need an equip, a, a device? That's maybe step two, but we know Chandler, Intel and Dell have partnered are doing incredible things with a device so maybe our device as a service program so maybe we focus on scaling and supporting right we actually partnered with ASU to launch a first of its kind in the country um 24 7 call center support service for underserved communities to have tech support for them in like 25 different languages which is absolutely unbelievable so we're really focused on helping connect the unconnected and so what we did Oh uh, geez, a couple of weeks ago, I don't even know, is we held our, our launch of this program, the, the State of Digital Equity in Arizona. If you see, we're actually able to be joined by Councilman Stewart. So thank you for joining us. I still, I think I stole your picture uh, in Mayor Harkey. And so it, the, the goal of this initiative, and we actually had federal representation here, uh, Angela Bennett, she's the first ever digital equity director at the federal level. She flew in just to speak at this program. Um, and so what it was do, what we did is raise awareness for digital equity and digital inclusion. So I would love for this event to be in Chandler next year for the second ever digital, uh, state of digital equity in Arizona. So maybe Terry, we can work with you to have this. Yeah. Um, and so just to, just to tie the knot, and I'll wrap up here, and I'll talk a little bit about what I'm doing at Amazon now. Um, but just to tie the knot here, why does this matter? You have to think about it, right? As we're extending connectivity, as we're connecting students, as we're connecting underserved, providing them laptops, right? Everything's gonna be connected. What does that lead to? Vulnerability, right? Everything's connected. Now that leads to vulnerability for cyber attacks, right? And the worst thing we could possibly do is really help underserved, unserved communities connect, but then not provide them with the cybersecurity necessary to keep them safe, right? They're gonna be probably one of the top ones uh, um, 
focus for attack. So this is kind of the things we're doing. If we can connect them, then how can we protect them as well? So if you're interested, Erin Carr Jordan, we gave uh, turned the, the torch over to her. She's the managing director um, for the Digital Equity Institute. So please feel free to reach out. In in two minutes, I'll go through this quickly. I'm sorry, I'm Italian. I love to talk. I, I'll keep on. <laughs> um, for what I'm doing, Amazon picked me up about three months ago to lead their uh, on the U.S. leader for the cloud innovation center. Now, uh, so what the cloud innovation centers are is this really interesting concept that Amazon came up with. Um, there are public private partnerships located within universities and they're safe places where communities can bring challenges and we help them solve it for free. Uh, we put them through a working backwards process uh, and then we ultimately build them a prototype to solve any sort of community challenge that they're facing. Uh, and really what we do is we hire interns from the university to work on these problems so they have real world experience and ultimately they're building stuff that can help um, support the community. And, and as you can guess, we have one here uh, at Arizona State University. Um, so uh, this is one of the ones I'm managing now. We actually have one at Cal Poly, one at UC Davis, and I'll be opening up these across the country. So really exciting. And again, it's just it's, it's a mechanism that AWS provides back to the community to help solve any sort of public sector challenge that you're facing. So potentially maybe there's a cybersecurity challenge we can take on uh, at the studio. Uh, just what does this look like? And this is like really exciting. We just did this with the Cal Poly kick, but as you know, opioid, the opioid pandemic is a major problem. We worked with the county to develop a, a mobile app that in real time connects people with the floxin. I always get that wrong, which is the life-saving medicine. If anyone's having a, a, an overdose, it immediately in real time connects anyone in the area that has the floxin with the person that's experiencing an overdose. So it's, it's kind of delivering that service in real time at the moment it's needed. So this is an app that we developed with the, the County of San Luis Obispo that we're now helping spread across the country to help solve that problem. So that's really that's really it for me today. Excited, always excited to come back. Councilman, thank you for having me. Perry, thank you for having me. And thank you for your continued leadership. It's, it, it makes me proud to say that I'm from Chandler. So thank you. Great, thanks, Tom. Thank you. Questions for him. Yeah, Tom, I want you to talk a little bit because when you and I first started working together, it was you were, um, I think you were working on your master's at the time. Um, but you also talked about because the cybersecurity also affects in the AV space. And Chandler's kind of been the lead on that. Do you want to touch on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Definitely not the, the, the expert, but as we know, you know, these are basically data center on wheels. Right, and they're constantly communicating. We're developing technology now for the rapid communication from vehicle to infrastructure. And you can only imagine as they're talking to, a, you know, the, the infrastructure, your street lights talking, your intersection is talking to the car, telling it it's a red light. Could you imagine if someone hacks that and starts to play with the ability for the car to communicate to the infrastructure in this intelligent uh, intersections? So we know we're investing heavily in the area of cybersecurity and all things transportation, but specifically autonomous vehicles as well, because it's a major, major focus, especially at the federal level. Uh, the DOT is looking at that massively. And so I'm sure there's companies in this room that are working on that sort of technology as well and would love to have those benefits. Well, and that kind of ties in also, Amazon is testing some new delivery systems and threat cybersecurity attacks on those. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, I don't have any specific information on that, but yeah, I mean, cybersecurity, if you look at our tech stack, cyber is at every single level of that tech stack. And so, I mean, it's uh, we have a cyber person and team that is involved in all of our three teams, our, 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 uh, deliver, our, our uh, warehouse teams, every team has cyber included in it. And, it's what the fastest growing, I'm sure you'll, you'll talk about it, like one of the fastest growing um, industries in, that we need employees in. And we're, we're hiring like crazy in that space. So we're excited to see programs being developed all the way down to the high school level that we can start to build that pipeline in for. Great, thank you. Thank you. Save it up with a question here, Rob. So I think you have a question. So I noticed that you had a lot of the Coalition of data infrastructure workers. I'm just wondering on the data side, given that I, I see government and public before, how, how are you getting shared data agreements in place? How, because you know, everybody builds their PXM, nobody wants to share, then you've got different protocols for, for security. 
Uh, I look at the stack up and down. Yeah. There's always problems there. How are you going to get over that? I've been, I spent 30 years of a career fighting that as a chief information officer. Yeah, definitely. It's our, it's a, it's a tough process and it just takes relations and work. I know we have our CIO in the room and do I hear the CISOs in the room as well? Um, and so, yeah, it's, you know, what we've learned over the three years of doing this, start small, right? Find that use case that governments feel comfortable sharing the data back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me. We, we, yeah, we try, we, and we failed. We tried, we we're like, okay, we'll build this data exchange. It'll be great. It'll be massive, right? And then it was just too much, right? right. There are too many yeah. issues. And so we're like, okay, how can we start with maybe a specific transportation related project where we're, you know, trying to do integrated intersections or something like that. And if you start small, um, and then you can grow from there. That's what we've really well, realized. You, in my opinion, I don't labor, this ties back into the year I mean, 20, almost 25 years ago, I used to sit at the Bay Columbia and I spent a conversation. I had a conference over getting design on the paper. Mm -hmm. There's a tie in here for your, for your community activism in terms of being able to bring in the digital divide piece. Uh, those are the kids you want doing this project. Right, uh, you, you can bring those folks in for, for internships and ramp up and get that work done. If there's case studies out there for that, anyway, I'll, I'll let you sit. But no, that's just tell me <laughs> I love it too, and that's what we say as a company. A lot of companies have diversity goals, right? In their in their company, you can't start like if you have a diversity goal of being X diverse in 2030, you can't start in 2028 and expect to achieve those goals. You start to invest in the future today, right? Grow that diverse work field, invest in them now so that way you can hire them and have those goals. So yeah, so I exactly, I applaud you for that, that comment. Yeah, thank you. Right. Thank you everyone. All right, let's give John a big round of applause. He's gonna be here to answer your questions right now. So our next speaker is Director Janet Cartel. Um, she has been in academia for 14 years. She taught cybersecurity at Basha High School for two years before becoming the cybersecurity director. Janet has served as content specialist committee member for the National K-12 Academic Content Standards in Cybersecurity Education through cyber.org and is published and has been published in both World at Work and DistrictAdministration.com. Her passion is to see education and industry partners together to build the cybersecurity pipeline. And boy, I, I couldn't have seen that already better with the conversation that we've already started. It's about forming those partnerships, thinking out of the box, and applying those techniques to students. So please help me in welcoming Director Hassel. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you on behalf of Kevin and my team for the cybersecurity program, How We're Growing Pipeline. First of all, I do want to start out with the statistics because I want you to know that um, as a school district, we are well aware of them and we keep them in the forefront of our mind as we plan our program. It's not something we just threw together and said, hey, let's make a cybersecurity program. But we looked at what the need was and what the need was going to be. And we said we want to fulfill it. So security is needed in every single domain. Anything that connects to the Internet or collects data needs to be protected. And if you have a, if you know cybersecurity, you have a job for life, and that's what we that's what we have for our kids. The information security analyst job is typically the job that we hear most about, and it will be the tenth fastest growing occupation over the next decade at thirty one percent. That's almost eight times as many uh, as as much growth as the average job, which is about four percent, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It requires diversity, so we hit on diversity. And diversity is a hot topic here. Diversity isn't just a checkbox for cybersecurity. Diversity is what literally makes us stronger. It is necessary for diverse collaboration, diverse mind, thought, um, mind thinking. And like I describe it to my parents and students, when you're a toddler and you play with this little box with all the little shapes in it, I don't know what you were like as a toddler, but I could take that circle and I could cram it in that square all day long with it pound hard enough, right? But it doesn't fill the shape. It doesn't fill the problem. We have to have the people that will fill that problem in that shape. And the only way to do that is through diversity. Employment um, options. So again, the analyst job is, is one aspect of it, and it's less than a third of the type of jobs that are out there. And I guess the reason I'm telling you this is so that you know, I'm not just preparing students to be analysts. 
three pen testers. That's a great job, and there's plenty of them out there and things like that, but there are so many other careers in cybersecurity that we need to prepare our students for that we need to make them aware of. Um, so it's not just one, one thing. There are 3.5 million jobs that need to be filled. There are 600,000 in the United States, and there are 16,000 spots in Arizona right now that need to be filled. When I used when I first did this presentation about three and a half years ago, that number was, I think, like 6,400. So that's how much that number has grown since I've been doing this. So how is Chandler Unified preparing or getting students ready for this? Well, first of all, in 2019, we opened up the BASHA ICON Center. That's the one that everybody hears about. ICON stands for the Institute of Cyber Operations and Networking, UIS, sometimes remember that. But we opened that in 2019. We're in our third year right now. Very exciting. We start out with 50 kids. We have 152 right now. Then the even better news is that this fall, we are opening up CTEP, Chandler Technical Education Center. And that's going to be just north of our Chandler High campus. We are opening up yet another cybersecurity program there. We have 75 kids enrolled already in that program. So really super exciting um, to have that. We're gonna be able to work with our students in the Northwestern part of the district and now with FASHA um, down in the Southeastern part of our district so that we can meet the range of students that are in our school. So how do we build a program that attracts people um, into it? Well, first of all, we build a quality program. We look at what the need is, and we look at the curriculum. We don't just pick up the first book that's there. We really meticulously look at what meets the objectives, both because we're a dual enrollment program and we have to meet the um, objectives for being a dual enrollment program, but also the objectives for um, the certifications and things like that. Partnerships, we partner with quality um, schools that are going in the same direction, the same passion that we have as well. So we partner with Chandler Gilbert Community College. We partner with the University of Arizona Chandler because they share that vision that we do too, that this is open for everybody. It doesn't matter where our students go. It matters about the education and things that we can give our students to prepare them. Pathway options. Not every kid's going to college. I learned that the hard way too. Um, so, but they're not. And so we need to have pathways. We need to give them options. And I'll talk to you about what those look like. Connecting with junior highs. As much as I'm a pipeline for all of you, I have to have a pipeline as well. So that pipeline to me looks like my junior hires. It looks like my elementary school kids, and I know that. So we reach out to those kids. We explain to them what cybersecurity is because there is still that information gap, if you will. I talk to school counselors about how to how to find kids because it's not it's it's everybody. So we need to look at everybody as a possible cybersecurity person. Um, public informational media and online presence, that's super important as well, because we do have people who come from out of state that look at schools. I don't know how many of you have come to Arizona from a different state, okay, and you had to look for a school for your kid. Um, I've done that, and I've been on school websites, and I literally can't find anything. And I'm thinking, okay, you have a program, but I can't find anything. My job is to be transparent. I want a parent to be able to look at my website, look at what curriculum I have, who is my teacher, what am I doing, what does my facility look like, so that they know we're getting a quality program. Education is a service, but it's a choice. And I'm competing. I'm competing with private. I'm competing with um, charter. I'm competing with other public schools, for that matter. And so I want to make sure I have the best offering for that parent and that student. Our partnerships, as I mentioned, are with Chandler Gilbert Community College. University of Arizona Chandler, and we've also partnered with ABL Advanced Business Learning. Our curriculum, hey, that sounded good. I should have left it in white. Okay, starts out the first year is hardware software. So that's basically like A plus. You can't mitigate a problem unless you understand what's inside that machine. So our students learn to take that machine apart, load it with an operating system, and really get to learn the ins and outs of it. Our second year is Linux and networking. So they learn how to connect all of that together. And then they learn about the operating system. Linux is an operating system like Windows, for I don't know how many of you, and I don't know who I'm speaking to, but um, that is used on most company servers. It's an open source um, operating system. And then security and ethics is our third year. That's what we're covering right now. That's where we tie it all together. And of course, you have to infuse ethics into it. And then the last year is our Python course. 
So educational flexibility, because we offer it at the high school level, they have a flexibility um, that they can start the program at any time. They can start as a freshman. Hey, I know what I want. I have four years I can do it in. Or maybe I'm a senior. I think I really want to do this. Okay, well, come on in. Everybody starts at the same point because we're dual enrollment. We start with the same classes so that they can move seamlessly on to the community college or the university, whatever they choose to do. Also, because they're at the high school, they can still participate in all the things that makes them a teenager, right? The, the dances, the athletics, the clubs, the organizations, ROTC, and we have students in every one of them. It makes a better, makes a better well-rounded person, not just height into the into the technology, there's nothing wrong with that, but um, also to be well-rounded and to be used to people and, and out there. And as as well, our program is part of what we call CD which is career and technical education. And the reason this is important is because we don't just teach Linux. It's part of the network security CTE program. And what that means to you is that we have certain obligations that we have to meet as a CTE program. We have to have leadership development. We have to have soft skills, clubs, and competitions. And we have to check all of that off. So with our students, we intentionally prepare them for professional things by joining a club, taking them down to conferences, putting them in leadership uh, seminars and things like that, where they learn to speak, they learn to manage, they learn to run things, um, and then develop and hone those soft skills, as well as competitions, which I'll go into a little bit later. Um, the, op the options, because we're connected with the different schools, of course, we have the associate's degree option, in our program alone, I don't know how many of you know what dual enrollment is, but dual enrollment in a nutshell is where I can teach that class in high school with my teacher that's been certified by the college saying, hey, you're dual enrollment, we're, we're good with what you know and, and you can teach for us. The student takes the class at the school, they get credit for it with us at Chandler Unified. We're like, hey, you got a credit, you did really well, you get an A, but they also get the three or four credits with the college and that creates their transcript. So when they're done, they end up with 31 college credits just in technology. All six, seven of our high schools have additional dual enrollment classes in English, science, social studies, math, and, and whatnot all. And so if they take advantage of those as well, they are so close to their associate's degree. And this is huge because it saves them a ton of money in the end, and it fast tracks them into the field, if you will. We also have that partnership with the University of Arizona Chandler. And so because of that partnership, those credits are already okayed by the university. And they're like, yep, you have that. We're going to give you full credit for that. We're going to give you full credit for that. They don't have the nitpicking that sometimes happens when you transfer and I transfer to universities like five times and you know what that's like. Um, so they don't have that. It's seamless. It's nice. It's smooth. And they progress into whatever cybersecurity um, area they want to go into. And then for students who don't want to go on to school, and yes, we have those, um, we have a relationship with ABL, Advanced Business Learning. Advanced Business Learning works with the um, state of Arizona in the workforce development, and they get our students so that they can pass one of the CompTIA exams. They give them cyber range time, which is super important, um, and then they place them in a job. And they can do this for little to no money because of that workforce development um, package and, and grant that they fall under. So it's a great situation. We have two students there right now. They're doing extremely well. It really fit their need. I'm so you know, happy for them. Just like industry, we look at KSAs, knowledge, skills, and abilities. So how do we let you know that our students know what they know, right? So we try to tie our, all of our subjects to industry grade exams, CompTIA exams, which are international. Um, and so I know that there's a little bit of, you know, bickering about, well, really how important is that certification? Oh, they don't need that certification. But here's the deal. If I send you a student and I say, they took a Cisco class at my school, they got to be. You're like, great. What, what does that mean? Okay. But if I tell you they took a Cisco 140 class and it was dual enrollment, and then they pass one of these tests. Well, now I know they know 80% of the information from that CompTIA you know, exam, and they know about this much on networking and things like that. It gives you a better baseline as to what they know. It's my only tangible, if you will, that I have to show you what we've done. 
also skills. So how do we show skills? We show skills by uh, participating in what we call capture the flags. So capture the flag is a gamification of cybersecurity in this case. And we, use, uh, we will be using Cyber Patriot and National Cyber League. And um, what it does is it gives the students a virtual environment to practice cybersecurity skills, defensive, offensive. Um, they learn to harden the system. They earn points. They win. They don't win, but they learn a skill. And in the case of NCL, we just added that this year to my um, security class. They give them a scouting report. So they give them like a little chart that shows them, here's where your strengths were. Here's what you did well on. And they can screenshot that and literally put it on a resume. And that helps, again, the employers looking at them understand a little bit more about what the student's strengths might be. The abilities. The abilities come in the form of internships and externships. So we've been participating with Elevate Ed, which again is done through the uh, Chandler, no, um, the Greater Phoenix Economic Council. And um, we've had a couple of students participate in this. So an externship is kind of like an in internship, but you're not actually at the facility. And they work with companies. They listen to the people who are hiring. They listen to the people who are in the field. They work on special projects. It's really great. It's meant a lot to my students who have been participating in it. And it's done virtually. So again, we can participate in it without having to send our kids all the way up to um, the inner part of Phoenix. And then this year, for the first time ever, we got um, internships. Three juniors in high school were selected by open source integrators out of Gilbert to um, be interns this year. I cannot even begin to tell you what that means. If you're a parent, you know what that means when your kid comes home and says, you know, they won the big prize, because that's what it's like um, to see that they're so excited. The second years are talking about, well, how do I get that internship? Or what do I have to do? And well, you have to learn Linux. Okay, you know, because that's the hard one. Um, so, but they're really, really excited about it and, and about the possibilities. And our students are learning so much, especially about the cloud, because this um, company does a lot with uh, Kubernetes and containers and things like that. Stuff that we haven't covered a, a whole lot of, um, about right now, but we will. Um, and, and so they come back with that information, they tell the other students. So it's been a great experience. And that's my presentation. So thank you for letting me share a little bit about what our school does. Talk about a little bit because not everybody in the room knows what when you talk about building this program. Can you also talk about the infrastructure? You put it in a completely like separate little um, nutshell <laughs> so that they can hack into the um, the one that's up there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> talk a um, little bit about that. You know what? Um, I'm not highly technical. Um, I like to think I am, but I'm not. <laughs> so I can tell you, I walked into that infrastructure that was put into us. I know the district spent a lot of money on a building with 11 classrooms to fill with 350 students. And that was my objective. And they put in some really special bells and whistles in there for us with fiber, a lot of fiber. Um, ways for us to connect our classrooms, ways for us to connect to the outside where we don't have quite the firewall. Um, that we would if we were on the district network. So we have what we call the black network because all the jacks are in black. And then we have the blue, which is the USB. And our kids go in through the black network and they can download um, Wireshark. They can download things that they wouldn't necessarily be able to do um, on the district network um, because we're subnetted, because we're, we're protected. They're shielded from our students. Um, and so, yeah, that's about the best I can do. That's great. No, that's good. Anything else? It could have been over a lot of their okay. <laughs> so questions. Great. Thank I just you. wanted to let you guys know that Jana has been awarded Cyber Educator of the Year as a national recognition. So thank you for that. Congratulations. So thank you. All right. They may come up with some questions yet here. So I'd like to invite one of our other public policy interns up here, Max Horn. Max is currently a senior at ASU, majoring in political science and psychology. He is a server at Oak, um, Spaghetti Factory right here in Chandler, and has worked there for a couple of years. He loves interacting and seeing the community and um, really wants to be on the policy side with, with um, the public political science degree. So welcome, Max. 
Thank you. Please go ahead. Our next speaker is Director Paul Wagner. Director Wagner is a professor for University of Arizona Cyber Operations Program. He specialized in both networking and cyber forensics. Prior to becoming a full-time professor, he served over 20 years in the U.S. Army. As an Army signal officer, he worked in various roles, including space operations, IT, network management for combat units, and combat support hospitals, and most recently supported the intelligence community in developing and providing communication and with network capabilities through the intelligence field. Please join me in welcoming Director Wagner. Can everybody hear me? I'm not a fan of this, so I can't. I'll just shut that down. So, like I said, my name is Paul, or like I was introduced, my name is Paul Wagner um, from the University of Arizona. Please don't hold that against me. Um, I know kind of where I'm at. A couple of years ago, um, our representative here, she has moved on to another job, said, Hey, I'd like to take you over to Bash High School to meet this individual who's directing this program. I'm like, Okay, let's go see what this is like. I'm new to the area, new to Arizona. And that's when I met Janet. And it's been an amazing journey because you see the passion that she has for this and she's humble. You would never have mentioned any award. There was a couple of weeks ago, I was like, hey, I saw you in the newspaper. She's like, I don't know what's going on. But she's an amazing individual and very dedicated to doing what she needs to do for this. And I'm really excited to be a partner with her and everybody else. So I'm from the University of Arizona and I'll go through a couple of things. And the first part is leading kind of this pathway. So. I'm a terrible representative of a university because with cybersecurity, it's not about having that degree. It's having a pathway to a degree, but the end result is employability. How do I get a job? How do I get into the workforce and maybe not go into extreme debt while I'm trying to get to that? And cybersecurity provides that pathway. So we look at it more as like a, a super highway. I'm going down the super highway, I'm 1,000 miles an hour, I'm in high school, but I hit graduation. Well, then what? Do I go into the workforce? Do I go into the two-year? Do I go into the four-year? Go in the military? What are my options as I'm going through? But that seamless pathway is there to make sure that we can get people from one direction to the other, and they can come on and off that off-ramp to get the skills that they need to do the jobs that they need. So that may be a degree. It may be one certification from industry. It may be a two-year degree or a certificate, which provides a series of skills that go along with it. So that's where this partnership, this roadway, this map leads to. So what sets our program apart from others? So there's this thing called the Centers of Academic Excellence. So it's an NSA FBI kind of project that says your school meets these requirements to be this. So our school is one of 24 in the nation that hold the cyber operations designation. And then there's about 230 that hold cyber defense. And then there's a research thing as well. But as long as you're doing cyber research, they kind of just say congratulations. The other part is the intelligence community center of academic excellence. Um, we're the only college that holds both of those designations. And I'll explain why that's important here in a second as we show how all of these things come together. We like working with any agency that's willing to work with us. Now, agency as in like the federal government, state government, whatever needs to happen, but industry as well. We know that it's an ecosystem. It's those blurred lines. Our critical infrastructure is usually housed with private companies, not with the public infrastructure. So those are some of the things that we do. The other pieces where these partnerships matter is opportunities for scholarships. So there's two major scholarships that are out there, scholarship for service and the cyber scholarship program. I went in the military to pay for college and I didn't expect it to be a career, but these two scholarships are 100% tuition paid for, $25,000 stipend every single year you're in it, and a guaranteed job with either a federal or a government agency afterwards. It's a one for one commitment. So you do one year here, you get one year there, and you're done with that commitment. Huge opportunity for this, and it can go up to four years. So they can get their two years for finishing our bachelor's degree or, and another two years in the master's program. They owe four years, but that's a $200,000 package before you even get into school. So pretty impressive. So this is kind of the outline, and this is where I say like the intelligence and information operations and the cyber operations kind of blend together, and you can kind of see the specifics along the bottom there. On the far left, um, cyber engineering are kind of NSA working in the basement, figuring out what they need to do, exploit writers. They don't talk about what they do, but they're probably working on things against other nation state actor type things. All the way over where you see um, information warfare. So we've seen this a lot, the elections, different things like that that are going into it. Well, when you see that propaganda that's coming out, well, who do you believe? 
Um, excellent Netflix series on the um, Cambridge Analytica attack. So basically it's a evaluation of how this company used data analytics to like change elections in different countries, not from like a couple of votes, like 80% to 20%, but it used to be like a 55% market kind of thing, it's crazy. So we look at all of these different things and a couple of other pieces that are unique, cyber law and policy. So we have people that have that technical background, but then they can also speak to executives. So that's kind of a gap, okay? You think of the, the hoodie nerd kind of sitting in there working on the computer that can't speak to anybody, not their peers, not to another organization, not to executives. So how do you take that information, that very technical stuff and say, hey boss, here's why this matters to you. Here's what you should do about it. Because as cyber people were like, no, we need this tool. We need to protect, we need to protect. And the business person's like, no, no, I need to pay the bills. I need to do this. Why is the return on investment for what you're telling me worth more than just paying the issue, paying the ransom, figuring out what's going on? So it's a long spectrum of what's going on. And the other piece, not only are we building the pathways down to the K through 12 area, we're building it the other way as well. So we recently received a $6 million grant from the Board of Regents to say, hey, you need to work on workforce development and building this talent pipeline. So we're hiring a number of faculty, we're building this out, and then we're gonna build out a master's and a PhD program here in Arizona. It will be the first one in Arizona for uh, cybersecurity at a PhD level. But what that's gonna do for you or anybody is research, collaboration, finding those problems that you may not be able to solve or that you want somebody to work on for you a little bit. That's where we're gonna come into play with that. So we're looking at all over the world and it's interesting. I'll talk about this tool that we use to kind of deliver our education, but it tracks students as they log into our virtual environment. So we're looking at the map, it's real time. And we're like, why is there a dot in the middle of the ocean? It's like, well, Hawaii's over here. What is this? And we're like, oh, it's one of our Navy students that are remoting in, floating home <coughs> somewhere that's attending this. So we're extraordinarily accessible around the world. If anybody's tried to use internet on a cruise ship or in some other place, not real reliable, same with like Navy ships are using satellite communication. They still get a fully functional environment even off of that. So our growth. So we started in 2016, we had about five students. And since then we received our designation in 2018 and we're right at 850, 900 students right now. We just had graduation, so the numbers are a little bit flux. But over that period of time, that's a huge level of growth. Well, again, what does that mean to you? We have people that need jobs, so if you have jobs, please help us get them. If you need interns, please help them get that. The other part of it is we're trying to either keep students in Arizona so that they can work in Arizona or invite them to Arizona so that they can come to our communities to be able to flourish in these environments. The other part, uh, intelligence information operations is a little bit new of a program, but you see kind of this weird exponential growth. I mean, it's Kind of shocking we can't even keep up with instructors to be able to teach so it's a good problem to have i guess but we went from 66 to 175 to 350 majors within this now the key things for this is i spoke about the information warfare but law enforcement intelligence so it's designed for border patrol and other agencies here to use intelligence capabilities to keep bad things from happening talked about the opioids and stuff like that well we have a huge problem here as well of different things coming across the border how do we protect that? How do we integrate with law enforcement and different things, which also relates to business analytics? So our virtual learning environment is a custom built platform, which I don't know, it sounds better than maybe it really is, but there's different ways that companies have done this. So SANS is one of the major training organizations in the country. I mean, they're extraordinarily expensive, about $8,000 a class. Um, so it makes it very unattainable for very many people. But what they did or what they used to do is actually send people a thumb drive with all of their tools every time. Well, that's not achievable for a university, a state school to say, well, we're going to do this. So we built this platform so anybody can remote in and have access. But what it really provides is not so much trying to figure out the environment. How do I put my stuff together? But really, I can just go and start playing. I can practice. I can train. I can do what I need to do. And we've had the FBI. We've had the um, NSA come in and do training in that environment because it's safe. If they go in and they break something, it's okay. And they don't go to jail. Our student enrollment goes down when people get arrested, so it's a lot of fun. And it looks like a real world. So one of the things that's kind of interesting is if you 
if you use any kind of gamification for training, it's very structured. It's like, do this, click here, go here. Our students log in, they're like, it's a desktop, what do I do? It's like, exactly. You're not gonna be given this gamification and here's how you solve the problem when you get into the workforce. Now, whether that's for cybersecurity or for anything, critical thinking is valuable. But the other thing that we put in here is an artificial intelligence that actually runs social media, does business networking, business simulations. Um, our organizational leadership and regional commerce now does work in here. So they run real businesses, they have to make inventory. And the cool thing is that goes into this lab with actuators, it looks like Amazon shipping kind of thing where it kind of goes down the conveyor belt and you can watch your shipment go through and our cyber students pack that, divert that package to somewhere else and steal it. Kind of neat. Um, but what, why that's important, yeah. You're like, oh, that's not me. That's terrible. What are you talking about? What are you teaching your kids? Um, but the thing about it is we're taking the physical world, putting it into a virtual world. So any student anywhere in the world can have access to that. We can't ship equipment to all of our students. So how do we make it the most realistic thing that they can possibly do in that environment, wherever they're at? This is some of the websites that are there. Um, so like I said, there's now over a hundred different websites. So when those students come in, they choose a company and they're like, hey, I wanna be a bike manufacturer, a bike reseller, I wanna own a coffee shop. And then they have profiles that actually go along with it. So it's kind of interesting. And this is where it kind of gets strange and dark and a little weird. So this Proteus artificial intelligence is what's running this. So this is an actual profile. So either the student or the art or the instructor or the artificial intelligence can actually go in here and pretend. But if this person is in remember Barbados and they say, hey, you're from Barbados and that's really cold here today. Well, that's not what reality is. And kids are smart. So no, it's 78 here. What are you talking about? It's cold. These are all live cams that the instructor gets to see for the location for that fake persona that they're working with. So it kind of gets into the strange here. So we teach students how to like build these profiles, how to identify where fake is. So it's really nice. Here's a couple of those custom applications that I was talking to. This really just goes into what we have as a training environment, our business simulation, and where we're going. And I think this is what's really important and where we kind of need your help. Um, I really believe that students need the opportunity, they need the experience, they need the hands-on to be able to function. They need that chance. So we run into problems with our students being able to get past the firewall, if you will, of getting a job because HR or something is turning it away. Understanding what you really want and communicating so that we can get you the right students to do the job that you need them to do for whatever it is. And then there's the partnership aspect. So it comes into Cyber Patriot being able to work with Janet and her students here in August to run those programs. And Yes, we say she's got an amazing facility, she does, but she needs help. So if there's ever anything, any equipment, like we're gonna throw this in the dumpster, please consider it and giving that <laughs> those resources. I know that she's like, what are you talking about? Don't say this, but it's true. We have these public, um, we have assets. We talked about, well, we need internet. Okay, we got that solved. We need equipment. Well, some places do, some places don't. So how do we invest in that next generation? And how do we invest in people that may not have access to this program? So other things we've looked at is how do we build a hub so that we can spread this great program to the entire state of Arizona? How can we build this where, how many CTE instructors do you have? Three, including me. Three, for a program that's about to almost double another 30%. So how do we solve the problem with educators being able to train them and say, oh, by the way, we're gonna pay you about 25% of what you can make in industry, but please come deal with these kids for eight hours a day and make that happen. There is a true passion for educators and being able to invest in them and give them that opportunity is huge. So if there's something here in the district, something that you can do to help incentivize or change things, please reach out to us. We love to have the conversation. It's gonna take reform, it's gonna take a lot of work, but we are definitely passionate in making that happen. So I think that's it. Questions? The number of cybersecurity tags um, that we have to pay. That wasn't me. Who's that up there? Oh, that was you. Council member, how many um, cybersecurity tags are we saying? I'm going to need uh, information technology information. That's what we're putting to you. We're putting on the webinar yesterday. 
and one third of uh, cyber attacks are on, on city or state or federal government agencies. This is it's a real dilemma. Mm -hmm. So, and, and this is not so there's a company out of Washington, it's called Pisces.org. And I found them a couple of years ago. I don't even know where it came from. And then I met somebody. And that's the great thing. You meet people in cyber, they're like, you're passionate. Can I talk to you? And we like glom <laughs> onto each other to try to enforce or enact change. Um, but this company built a whole training pipeline for small communities or K through 12 because they can't afford to provide that security. So they use students. It's a training within their educational programs, but then they provide that service free or no charge, just keep the lights on kind of thing to government agencies, to schools, critical infrastructure kind of thing, just because it's there. And it's interesting because everybody's like, I mean, I think there's, I don't remember who I was talking to, but there's been ransomware attacks at schools here in Chandler, right? Mm -hmm. It's happened. So it's not a matter of, is it going to happen again? It's when is the next thing going to happen and when are we going to have to deal with it? So how can we create that? But it's also risky. Like I don't, I have a 21 year old. That's another story. But when he was 16, <laughs> I didn't want him driving the car. So I can't even imagine being like, okay, let me take the person I don't want to drive my car. And I'm going to put him into the school to protect all the school infrastructure. That's a scary proposition. That's scary at 18. So there is some trust. There is some risk. There's some paradigm shifts to taking that 18 year old, putting them in that highly critical space with secure technology and saying, please don't put us out of business or please protect us. It, it takes conversations. You know, just to add to what you were saying, they talk, we talk about an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure as it relates to these are real dollars that cities like Chandler could be losing in this in this in the range of anywhere from eight hundred thousand to three million dollars. That is a lot of art, that's a lot of police, and that's real money that goes out the door. So getting invested is, is important and what you're doing is, is wonderful. And I also like your comments, um, a couple of things. You had talked about the increase in cyber attacks from a law enforcement standpoint and just um, in things that they are dealing with. And as communities, we're shifting on how are we, it, it's not just writing um, the speeding tickets and those kinds of things. It's shifting to in training them, the additional training that as a community that we need. So, um, and then I recently met with your dean of law here and um, I had the opportunity to have lunch with her. And it's very interesting because ethics and the whole um, legal component with all of the cybersecurity is tremendously growing at rapid rate. So very, very good information. Other questions? Yes. One thing I would suggest right off the bat, I was in an industry professional the other day and they were saying that most industry-wide com cyber companies are happy to share their people, go down to K-12. There's recent books that have been authored that talk about what pen testing is on a kindergarten level. So the industry professionals, although we're not all the time educators, we can go into the classrooms and you know have a professional day and read the book about what a pen test is on a level that a five or six year old would understand. So reach out to industry professionals, happy to share what we can. Another thing is a lot of um, security operation centers will open up their threat feeds to in colleges as, as an opportunity for you to immediately get insight as to what those indicators of compromise are looking like. So your, your people can automatically understand what's being done today, what's being attacked today. Yeah, I know some of the community colleges are taking that, like Pima, they have their Arizona Cyber Warfare range that's in there. They built their whole SOC specifically for that to start bringing those feeds in a little bit at a time, because like, oh my gosh, what are you talking about? There's 10,000 things you want me to look at? And it's like, no, 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 here's 10, what looks odd? Instead of, here's 10,000, Yeah. but, and then we kind of do that. So schools are evolving. We deal with a lot of bureaucracy, so it kind of makes it a little challenging to kind of keep up with industry, but I think everybody we have on our team has figured out how to hack the system, if you will, <laughs> to try to like get things through. And it's, it's been awesome. So we appreciate anything that we can get because the real world is what our students need. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Our next speaker is I am pleased to introduce Director Tim Romer from the Arizona Department of Homeland Security. 
Um, Director Romer was appointed by Governor Ducey as the Director of the Arizona Department of Homeland Security just in April of last year in 2021. Director Romer also serves as the state's Chief Information Officer managing cybersecurity at the state of Arizona. He has also served on multiple boards and commissions, including the Arizona Mexico Commission Security Committee, as well as the Human Trafficking Council. Prior to working at the state of, Air of Arizona, Director Romer um, admirably um, served on the Central Intelligence Agency for 10 years. As an Arizona native, Tim graduated from ASU with a bachelor's of arts degree in communication and a minor in political science. And look where you're at today. So put your hands together and welcome to us. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, I talk really loud, so I'm going to you guys are okay, okay. I'll leave this down. Um, first off, uh, thank you for inviting me and having me here. It's a great honor to be here this morning and great to follow your lead. I'm honored also to serve uh, on the board for the Masters in Cybersecurity uh, program at U of A that they just stood up. So we just had our first meeting about a month or so ago. And uh, I'm not mistaken, you are ranked second nationally in this program, which is absolutely phenomenal. So the reason why I bring that up is we have great partners in Arizona when it comes to cybersecurity of that point of passion for this topic. You've got Janet, who congratulations. I just found out this morning walking in that you won this great national award for cybersecurity educator of the year. Very well deserved. I've been to Basha High School a couple of times with Janet. It's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and Owen George uh, sitting in the back, uh, your phenomenal CISO for the city of Chandler. He spent at least 20 years working for the state of Arizona and doing amazing things. The city of Chandler is really lucky to have Owen. And the reason why I bring this up is cybersecurity takes that passion. It, it needs that teamwork because does anybody know, let's use one cyber attack. For example, solar winds got hit um, by Russian, we're gonna use criminal in quotation marks, criminal hackers. Uh, anybody know how many engineers, let's say, are estimated by Microsoft study to have worked on hacking solar winds? One, oh, sorry. One 15, person. 1,500 to 2,000. Yeah, there you go. So if you have, let's say, 1,500 to 2,000 engineers in Russia going after a U.S. company, how do we stand a chance by like one in two people working on this issue for our organization? It's an incredibly difficult task and it only really becomes easier if we work together, if we partner. And that's why so much of what we do as I bring up Owen is partnerships between state, federal and local. You need to be sharing threat information, you need to be sharing best practices and you need to be sharing tools. So I'm happy to say, if you don't know this already, uh, Governor Ducey has really put his money where his mouth is when it comes to cybersecurity. He's investing $10 million in a grant program that will go to state and local partners as well as school districts. Uh, so that $10 million will help give the same cybersecurity tools that we use as a state that smaller jurisdictions just simply cannot afford. Um, we're going to give that money through a grant program to help bring up other cities, counties, tribes, in school districts. And we're really excited about that. As soon as the legislature can pass the budget and get that approved, we will have that funding uh, here. And our team is already starting to work on the program. We want to use this as a way to pave the way to then start doing better with partnering with the private sector. Uh, government needs to do better. And when it comes to cybersecurity in the public private sector, uh, we know there's room for improvement there, but we've really said at the state is until we figure out how to collectively come together as government organizations um, around the state, then we're probably not ready to have that you know, partnership. We, we share threat information right now, but the opportunities are definitely there to do more. So if you represent private sector, obviously being at a Chandler Chamber of Commerce event, we understand that there's this need and this desire, and we're getting close to having that capability. I think on the federal side, DHS CISA is doing a better job of getting out good threat information and trying to find more partnerships. But we are well aware that you know that this opportunity is just now kind of getting to the forefront. And what I think what we need to do is partner more uh, with our education, both you know K through 12, 
uh, and then the universities and then great partners. Dominic, good to see you, uh, AWS now. And so um, that's really, I'm a big Simon Sinek fan of start with why. Um, so the why is really to our councilman's point in the back. Um, government organizations are becoming increasingly targeted by hackers. Uh, and what we're consistently hearing from the small organizations and the small governments is why did they come after us? So this is that Simon Sinek start with why. And that is everybody is a target. And for hackers, they're likely going after the most vulnerable and the least protected first because it's easier for them to make that money on ransomware. Uh, Councilman, you stole one of my favorite you know, lines when it comes to cybersecurity. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, Owen and I would say that all the time, which is why we wanted to be, when Owen was running all of our privacy and compliance with the state of Arizona, we wanted to be the most exercised state in the entire country when it came to cyber cybersecurity, because that ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. One of the best ways to prevent ransomware is to have a plan and execute and exercise that plan regularly for your emergency action planning. The other things like, you know, back up your information online, have good cyber hygiene, but you have to have a plan. CISA director Jen Easterly, who runs cybersecurity for the United States right now, just said this recently, she said, preparation beats panic. If you work for an organization, whether it's a private sector company, it could be uh, Intel in Chandler, it could be the city of Chandler, it could be you know, Chandler Unified School District. If you don't have a plan and you're not exercising that plan, when your worst day comes, you're not going to be able in, to be in a position to recover any of that uh, data, that funding. And then to the councilman's point about how expensive it is, um, we use regularly the IBM Ponyman study, um, and Owen and I have done this a lot through the years. Um, the average cost of a data breach to a U.S. company is around nine million dollars, right? As far as like being at a City of Chandler event, uh, let's look at City of Baltimore, City of Atlanta. Their data breaches that kept their systems down for weeks cost both of them you know, separately, not combined, but I think both of them hovered around the $20 million mark. That's a lot of money when it comes to city council, finding $20 million to go through a cyber incident. I'm giving real world examples is because we've used, we've used these talking points of an ounce of prevention for the town they cure. Well, that's why a million dollars on the front end to protect against the cybersecurity emergency, as opposed to spending $10 million on a cyber risk insurance plan, I think is more worth giving the $1 million instead of the $10 million. And I bring that up because I'm being asked regularly when I go to Chamber of Commerce events and everything else, people keep asking about cyber insurance. And they keep saying, how can we get the price down? What more can we do? And sure, there's ways to adopt more controls, bring down your risk score, or, you know, partner with your insurance um, you know, companies. But at the end of the day, it's become so expensive that my best advice to people is put more money in on the front end to avoiding that worst day case scenario so that hopefully you don't need it instead of saying my cybersecurity strategy is cyber risk insurance. Because I'm telling you right now, if that's your cybersecurity strategy, you're going to need the insurance. It's like when your car breaks down on the freeway and you're thinking, man, I put a lot of money into insurance that I'm going to need right now. I probably should have put a little bit of money into an oil change. Uh, Real world example, uh, I won't name the organization, but an organization in Arizona got hit with a cyber attack about a year and a half, two years ago. And when they were completely down, they referred to the situation and their press officer called it routine emergency maintenance. They were down for routine emergency maintenance. And our entire team was reading this in the office. We were like, I don't think that's a thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I wasn't born yesterday, but it's either routine maintenance or you're in an emergency. And to use the car analogy again, you don't have your car break down on the side of the road, call your dealership and be like, all right, I'm ready for that routine maintenance now. Oh, by the way, can you come and get me because I'm in an emergency? It's one or the other. And the reason why I bring up real world examples is because we can talk a lot about why cybersecurity is important. But until we give the real world examples, until we cost 
We talk about real costs that have been incurred around the country and around the world. And then let's not just talk about the financial costs, let's talk about the other types of costs. So Flagstaff Unified School District, when they got hit uh, with ransomware a couple years ago, they had to close their entire school district. Those were days of class that they were not allowed to have. This is pre-pandemic. There was not a, let's just go virtual for a couple of days. These were complete lost days of school for K through 12 in Flagstaff because some criminal hacker somewhere in the world hit them with a ransomware attack and took their entire IT services down for multiple days. So it's not just financial costs, it's costs to our livelihoods, our safety, our security, depending of you know, who's being targeted in these situations. So we know the why matters. We, we, you know, you're here, so you probably understand why you know, it matters. But now it's a little bit like how we can help. What can we do to help? I already mentioned the grant funding. That's something that we can you know, have out there that's going to continue to be invested in. We launched the Arizona Cyber Command Center, which gives us an opportunity to partner more from a threat sharing and response perspective with anybody who wants to partner with us for the state of Arizona. Um, so the Cyber Command Center is really what we launched collectively as a team. Uh, when the governor said cybersecurity is homeland security, and Terry mentioned in my bio, I got appointed to this job a year ago. I was serving as the CISO for the state at the time, and the governor um, asked me to be the director of homeland security, and I had previously been the deputy director of homeland security for four years prior to be running cybersecurity, and I, I kind of, at first, I was like, wow, you've got to say yes when the governor asks you to do something, but I really don't want to give up cyber. I don't want to leave my team. And I was so fortunate that the second part of that question was, will you be our director of Homeland Security and will you bring your cybersecurity team with you? So it was like this hesitancy of me like, oh man, I don't want to lose my team. So like, oh heck yeah, I'm in. <laughs> when do I start? And he's actually said cybersecurity is Homeland Security. When I get briefed in these cabinet meetings, I think that the threat to cybersecurity is just as much of a threat as anything else I'm briefed on. It should be run by a security agency, not an IT administrative agency. So we're really the second state in the entire country. New Jersey was first. New Jersey has cybersecurity run under their Department of Homeland Security, but their director of Homeland Security does not serve as the CISO. So I right now am the only person in the country that's wearing both hats. So I'm either crazy uh, or innovative, and we're at an innovation center, so we're going to go with I think we're innovative on this one. Uh, but I said before, I'm really trying not to mess this up for anybody else who wants these types of jobs around the country later on. Um, but when the governor did that and we moved the team to our counterterrorism and information center, because we needed a home. And I figured, well, if cybersecurity is truly homeland security, then we should be co-located under one roof with law enforcement and intel experts. Because if you're telling us cybersecurity is getting a seat at the table, I want the literal seat at the table. Like I want I want the actual command center there. So when we talk about what the state can do, us having increased capabilities now within the last year to have um, a new home, to have um, the capabilities when it comes to tools and resources and people that we need. And I should say in the governor's budget as well that, gosh, knock on wood, that uh, it gets approved here at the legislature, but there are four additional cybersecurity analyst positions in that budget for our team. So that's a significant growth for us. We've, uh, we've got, depending on hiring, you know, 16 or 17 employees on the cyber side of the house. So that'll push us over into the 20s. Um, so we're gonna have more of a capability then to partner with local government to run those grant programs more successfully. So uh, I hope it's, it doesn't come across that like, hey, we're going to be able to help you in the future. No, we're going to, in that future is like a month or two away. So we like being able to come to these events and to talk openly about what we're doing. Cybersecurity is one of those topics that a lot of people don't feel comfortable talking about cybersecurity because they think it makes them more of a target. But I'm telling you right now, you're a target no matter what. Uh, if you're at the city level, for example, go ahead and talk about it. I love talking about the state perspective. I never go out and say, I have all the answers. Come at us, hackers. We will bring it on. You know, No, I actually talk very deferential to hackers like openly. I'll be like, man, I hope anonymous people come after us. Man, that's going to be a bad day. Um, the hackers that are out there, especially when there's 2,000 from Russia coming after solar winds, is an amazing task to try to live up to. But they're coming after us regardless. 
So we owe it to our constituents, to our businesses, to everybody within our community that they know what we're doing to prevent it, how we can help, additional resources, and then also showing up and listening to others, which is why I'm going to stop for a second here in a few seconds, because I want to hear from you. It's always a part for when people ask me to speak at these Chamber of Commerce events and schools and everything else. I'm not one of those people who's going to push the time and then not leave time for Q&A, because a lot of times I get good questions from you all that help us change our policy and our budget requests in knowing what the requests are that are out there. So we know cybersecurity matters. The state is investing more funding. We're not just going to give it you know, uh, away in a grant program. We're also using funding on our own side to improve our capabilities from a staffing perspective, from a resource and facility perspective as well. And lastly, I'll just close with, we want you all as partners, whether you're public sector or private sector, we want that open line of communication. We want sharing of information. If something happens at one of your departments, we would love to know about it in a confidential manner because it's really difficult for us to protect seven and a half million <laughs> Arizonans data if we don't know who's being attacked within the state. So we see a lot of cyber attacks that you know, everybody wants all of our data. So whether it's ADOT or it's your revenue information or anything else, we're housing all of our citizens in Arizona data and the hackers want it because it's valuable. But guess what? At the same time, the same types of hackers that are targeting a community college or a business here are the same ones coming after us. When we share information, indicators of compromise and we automate our systems to be able to block those IP addresses, phishing emails, malware, whatever it is, we're all safer collectively together. So that's my last kind of like plug and call is to be, regardless of who you work for, having those open lines of communication is imperative to stopping this. Just think cybersecurity and physical sh security shouldn't be thought of as being that different. If somebody broke into your house, you would probably talk about or broke into your business, let's say. If somebody comes and attacks your business, you're probably going to talk about it publicly. It's going to be on the news, but for some reason, nobody wants to talk about a cybersecurity breach or a cybersecurity break-in. And we need that type of information to be able to prevent it from happening to the rest of us. So thank you for your time and your invitation. And then now I left at least a few minutes. There you go. Few minutes. Um, I, thank you so much. That was great information. Um, one of the things that, and, and I've got to bring up the elephant in the room, and I'm glad that you're appointed to that, but election. Arizona was, I don't want to be one side or the other on this. Bottom line, Arizona was not seen in the best light across the country. How do we stop that going forward? A lot of proactive steps. This is the unfortunate thing about that. We were doing a lot on the front end to partner in a bipartisan way on election security, and we just didn't get the attention that we hoped we would. So Secretary Katie Hobbs and I testified in front of the House Elections Committee of the Arizona Legislature about a month before the pandemic hit. And we talked all about the strong partnership between the Secretary of State's office, all 15 counties, our State Department, well, it wasn't the Department of Homeland Security, it's time running cyber, it was our Department of Administration, but it was our cyber team. And we did you know, testimony, we did a National Governors Association event uh, where Arizona was one of three states to win a policy academy of experts coming to Arizona, bringing all 15 county recorders and election directors together. The Secretary of State, uh, Katie Hobbs and I sat next to each other for an entire day event. We had the FBI there, we had DHS CISA, and we did a lot of really good work. And I think we probably should have done a better job publicizing some of the bipartisan things that were happening. We're getting people to listen because then it blew up into this real partisan issue with, and I'm just going to be completely candid, without any facts. So the governor certifies the election because there's no evidence, there's no facts. So it's show, show me the facts, show me the evidence, then we have a conversation. And he certified it, and then now we find ourselves into this long audit, which again, no facts were ever shown. So I think the, the sad thing for me as, I don't know if I'd call myself an expert on this, but I would say like from working in the industry is the fact that the state of Arizona and all 15 counties did a really good job. And none of them were given any credit for it. They were used like a political football 
And I think what we should, I, I guess the answer of this, I wanted to show you some facts, but I would say her records should speak louder. And I hope in time, their record of showing that they did such a good job through and through on this, I hope speaks volumes and has more of a lasting legacy nationally than just some of the politics that happened. But I think we within these positions can probably continue to learn from it and do a better job of talking openly about why, you know, protecting the integrity of your democracy is not a partisan issue, it's a bipartisan issue. Great point, and thank you for that. Um, at the Chandler Chamber, we have really taken a look at defense and cybersecurity as a key component for many years. Um, one of the other things for business, especially now that we are attracting so many semiconductor companies to Arizona, and but is the protection of that artificial intelligence and the collaboration and then from the enforcement side. So we've been also working with our federal delegation on that because that's gonna have to be a nationwide effort. So. Yeah, and keep in mind when it comes to protecting the microchip facilities, it's not just a cybersecurity protection, it's a physical security protection. So um, TSMC investing $13 billion in North Phoenix to build that facility is a huge threat to China. And China wants to be, oh, uh, let's say this, I give us some special. Uh, China is 100% targeting TSMC, just like they target our, our university. So, China wants to steal our intellectual property and our research data from our universities and use it. They want to affect the supply chain of microchips and they're gonna to try to do it in any way they can. So cybersecurity knows no border. So you're gonna defend against cyber attacks from China on these facilities like you normally would. I think the real threat to Arizona where we need to come in as leaders within Arizona and public safety is protecting the actual facilities that are here in Arizona. So there's a physical security threat, there's an espionage threat and there's a threat to the talent pipeline. So the way that you work this sadly that I know about this, or I don't know, fortunately or unfortunately that I know about this is you go after your workforce. So what we need to do, and we're, we're starting to have these conversations is help Intel, TSMC and the other companies really educate the universities and the students that when you're being recruited by these uh, companies, you're likely going to be a target and knowing you're a target from adversaries around the world like China that are gonna to try to infiltrate you, your way of thinking. And that is the world of espionage, uh, sadly. Uh, and people just don't think it happens in real life. And I can tell you from experience that 100% happens in real life and it happens within our own communities. It's not just in like a Jason Bourne type movie. Those get a little exaggerated. It's really more, um, you know, of a strategic um, plan. And so I think we within Arizona need to do a really good job of making sure that we're prepared to make sure that those companies get the best and the brightest workers and those workers are trustworthy. Great point. And I will tell you, I know that um, Supervisor Sellers, who was a former um, Chandler City Council person when he was first elected to, or appointed um, for the Maricopa County Supervisor, went to China on a sister city visit and his phone was hacked and he's like who knows who little old me is and it's because he was one of the supervisors of one of the largest um uh counties in the entire country yeah you can we don't want for anybody so yeah. like if you're going to china either don't bring your real phone with you or figure out another <laughs> way like, no yeah you, you sign up and you get yourself another account before you go <laughs> you get rid of that so um i'm just and i mean that Really honestly, like I'm not kidding, that's 100% what I would do. Yeah. Well, we got a question back here. Yeah. On the um, side of, of the cybersecurity, so it's great that you know, all the programs out there for large schools and whatnot. But given that this is a chamber and it's a small business, I would submit to you that your one of your largest schools may be coming through small businesses that interact with. State, right, yeah. and so I, I, I would just for you to think about how you solve those problems or how we can go about working through some of those issues because you know companies are out there and, and okay you know I got to go pay for this license or I've got to pay for whatever fee the, the state is charging well you don't know what they're doing and oh by the way that those are out there they're surfing their employees are surfing and they don't realize a lot of those things that 
those of us that are in the industry. Yeah. We'll talk about right. And so now I'm going through and I'm connecting to your site. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So a couple of things on that. Great point. Uh, it, it, it not just the small businesses from uh, they're coming after you all, but they want to come after you to get to us. Oh, that's well. what I mean. Like yeah. So no, it's, it's like the point. target. The target breach. You yeah. go through a third party vendor HVAC company instead of going after Target because Target is really well defended. So what we're doing as a state, and thanks to Owen for being the pilot for the city of Chandler nationally on a program called State Ramp, which is we're taking our as ramp process, which is the way that we review third party vendors doing business with the state of Arizona. It's the way that we ensure that a third party vendor has policies and procedures in place to protect state data. So even if you're a small company and you're going to be doing business, let's say like with ADOT, we have to, as a cybersecurity team, review that company first, make sure that you have checked all the boxes that we're comfortable with you even touching any piece of state data. Then we approve you to be on contract because we know the third party vendors are a target. So how did we want to move that into a national level? Well, some leaders nationally said, we want to do that because it's not helpful to businesses and it's too much regulation, it's too much red tape that a company comes into Arizona and they wanna get a contract with us as a state. And they go through all of ASRAMP, which is a pretty busy process. It takes some time to go through that. And then let's say they get on a contract or at least they're approved to get on the contract. Well, at that point, then they're like, okay, great. But we're, this is capitalism. So like, we don't wanna do the same thing in Colorado and Nevada. Guess what? Now they have to go through the exact same thing in Nevada and in Colorado. And so what we decided is we wanted to be the state pilot for how we do that nationally so that if you get approved in one and you're part of state ramp, you only get approved once. So if you're especially a small business that's difficult to go through that process, you get approved for state ramp. Now any state, we hope all 50 states buy into it, but let's say even half the states buy into it. Now you can do business in half the country without having to go through that really burdensome process anymore. So we piloted um, at, at a state level and now Owen is leading the way for the city of Chandler uh, and doing it for the city of Chandler uh, as well as like the case study. So I wanted to give an example of like one way we're thinking about that third party uh, vendor, but your point is it really resonates with me and I'll definitely continue to, to have that in conversations with things that we need to be aware of. I know SRP does that as well um, on their team on how to do your third party to do business with that. One more question. So um, from a small business aspect, you were talking about um, what's your plan, right? How do you make sure if, if I have a car, the dealer gives me a blueprint for maintenance. Yeah. As a small business, is there a place to go to find out how to ask the right question of your IT company yeah. of the plan, because they can talk about blah, 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 right. blah, and I'll have no idea. Yeah. Is it, is it a good plan? I don't know. Yeah, so CISA.gov, so CISA.gov is really the best. So CISA provides a lot of free resources, and they have a lot of things posted to their website that you can access. And if they don't have it on the website, I know you can go through us, you can go through Owen or myself, and we'll get it for you. But CISA has templates for emergency action plans and assessments as well. So what you're kind of talking about now is a basic assessment on like, where am I at? Where do I need to invest? It's like, it always starts with like, you know, low hanging fruit, cybersecurity awareness for your employees, you know, phishing training, things like that, some basic security tools. And then you're gonna work your way up into, you know, you AI, like Terry brought up AI. It's like, we always say like to any small business, like don't, go to the sales tactic of like, oh my God, I need all this great AI because at the end of the day, if you have like no cybersecurity awareness, no phishing training or anything else, jumping right in, it's like going and buying a Ferrari, you know, uh, as your first car type of a thing. And like, believe me, uh, you're going to get in over your head. You're probably going to crash it. It's probably, it's probably not going to work out so well. Cybersecurity tools are the same way. You should really be starting smaller with what works and then building upon sort of the layered security. So CISA.gov is the place to get that. And if anybody wants to monitor um, against threats to the US, that's the best spot to do it as well. So it's like CISA.gov slash shields up. But either way, when you go to CISA.gov, now shields up is the whole CISA in the, in the United States government's um, platform for sharing Russian cyber threats. 
And so if you want to block Russian cyber threats against your organizations, against your cities, against your small businesses, you can go right to CISA.gov, you go to Shields Up, it actually gives you all of the published indicators of compromise of malware that we know as a country is being used against Ukraine. And then what my team does, like the second that comes out, we go in and configure our systems to block all of it. So that's something that private sector companies can do as well. You grab that malware, you grab as many of those IOCs, IP addresses, everything that's in those documents, and then you start plugging it into your own tools to be able to block against it. Great question. Thank you so much. Yeah, just another shout out to our sponsors at Amazon. Um, the Project Intentional Assault Research Project, Planet Startup, Dignity Health Center, Regional Medical Center, Intel Catalyst Computer Technology, Southwest Gas, Edward Jones, Jerry McGibbon, APS, and Dragon Lock At the bottom of your agenda today, we have um, we are gearing up for our how we stand document, which is our legislative document. Um, and um, as I mentioned, we have that whole cybersecurity section in there, um, both at the federal, um, state, and local level that we um, that are important to us. We are going to be starting those roundtable discussion groups in June. Those are the dates that we'll be breaking up each of the sections of this book and really talking about it. We want to hear from you. So if you want to attend those, please let us know. We've kept them short to an hour um, so that we can gather input from you. And then we will be working all summer into the early fall to be able to put this document together, then bring it back, and then for our board to adopt that and take to our legislatures. So thank you for coming and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>